Well, because I don't want to get burned out on this guy. I don't want to be the guy who you know, just happened. You know, the reporter or whoever it is who sticks a mic in someone's face and said, how do you feel about your daughter dying in a car crash? And it turns out the first time the family finds out that the daughter is dead is from the reporter sticking a mic in her face. And I believe the retaliation that I got today for recovering from the news was the reporter going, well, I know how you feel. I lost a dog. And I'm going, are you nuts? Dog? Daughter? I know the big difference. Didn't want to be that guy. I, I uh, work with a, a couple different people, some guys out in Troy who do you know, kind of drag in productions. Uh, and I work at the post house in front of I know they do some producing. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's, let's connect. No, absolutely. Let's do a real feed or something. I'm not the fastest in the world. I'll tell you now. If you want something turned in 15 seconds, I'm not going to in depth kind of stuff. And that's what I want to get to. Um, you know, I want to have the chance to really tell something and really get all the time as opposed to, you know, raising a house fire, raising a house. You know, what that building is, I mean, it can be compelling if you're in the right place at the right time. But that's not, you know, a scanner in your truck. That's, that's not me. I've done some of that. I'm sort of done with some of that. But yeah, sometimes it's a huge job. Sure, definitely. Well, I got your uh, turn. I'm going to set on your site too. Yeah, yeah the, what's going to be on there is we'll tell you all about the association. Uh, if you have questions about some of the other details or anything else, just give me a call. If an instance or a web guy, I should probably pre apologize for the. I know it looks like a 90s website, but that's a perfect thing, not mine. <laughs> so enjoy the, the retrospective, if you will. All right. Uh, well, maybe I can help you guys out with that eventually. <laughs> that's not my department. I've had a good time getting in touch with the IT guys in here. Oh, there's something about bouncing emails. Absolutely. It's right here. I see they want to get started at some point. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What's that? We're not recording, are you? Uh, we, audio's going out live right now. You do this every week, then? You do this every week? I'm just uh, covering uh, for Roger Rail this week. I'm doing Ignite tomorrow. I'm doing Ignite tomorrow. You want, hey, you want to have lunch after this? I'm actually uh, meeting somebody for lunch after this. I like it's uh, 120. We can talk for a few minutes before I go over there. I was going to talk to you tomorrow, but since I saw you today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, it's high noon, 12 o'clock, time to kick off with lunch at our marketing, March 3rd. Glad everybody can get themselves settled in. We've got a full crowd here today. That's really exciting. How many people here are new to Lunch and Arbor Marketing? Welcome. 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 We meet every week here at Connor O'Neill's in the Celtic Room. We video stream live, so if you can't make it to one of the meetings, um, do catch us. We have Lunch and Arbor Marketing posted on our own website, la2m.org. We also have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn group, so you can always connect um, with us in that way. It's my pleasure to introduce David Kiley from ICON. Um, social media has been a big topic within Lunch and Arbor Marketing for some time, but we haven't heard much on social media for a few weeks, so it's my pleasure to introduce David and before I do that, <laughs> Stacy, our treasurer, is going to be passing the bowl, which is like a hat, only shaped differently. There is no um, fee for attending Lunch and Arbor Marketing, but we are a nonprofit organization, and we do support um, educational um, enhancement um, areas. Um, this being one of them, but we also put hardcore dollars towards education groups as well. So a suggested donation of $3 would be helpful. Don't feel obliged, but if you do donate, it is always appreciated. So Stacy is going to start to pass the ball, and over to David. <laughs> Now? Yeah, that's it. Uh, well, thank you for coming today. Uh, I have to say, this is uh, a guy named Kylie and Connor O'Neill's. So, you know, I think things are going to go okay. I'm actually half Welsh. Any Welsh people in here? Come on, all right. We've got to stick together. This is St. David's Day week this week. So, you know. Um, great. Well, I, uh, as the, the um, Bill says, we're going to talk about social media today, and um, it's a tricky subject, social media, because I feel like in, in our business and the clients we deal with and the people I talk to, businesses and individuals are at such different levels of understanding and aptitude and uh, orientation about social media. So when you're dealing with a mixed group, I was sort of wrestling with the presentation on making sure I gave something to, to everybody. So hopefully what I talk about today is not above anybody's um, uh, uh, you know, sort of understanding, um, but it may be a little bit below if you're you know, a real hardcore social media strategist or, or practitioner. Um, so the title that, you know, I, I, building followers, advocates, supporters, and communities, I think really sums up what social media is about. I have been a journalist, and I've also worked for two pretty big ad agencies, uh, Donor in Southfield and Loan Partners in New York, and so I worked for them before the advent of social media. So um, the difference between what we're dealing with today in terms of a marketing landscape and social media and what uh, traditional ad agencies you know, have been used to uh, is dramatically different. Um, 
the simple fact that I'm sure you can understand that advertising agencies are wired for push messaging, push marketing, you know, paying for something, paying for a message, paying for a place to put it, and then hoping people pay attention. And obviously, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you're in online forums, you know that um, we're all becoming, I think, de you know, desensitized to really paying that much attention to paid traditional media. I apologize that I can't fix this. It's, I think we're optimized for PCs here, and my I don't think we'll lose too much, uh, but that's defining social media. Uh, and just obviously, these are channels, uh, but I, I think, I mean, we all know what Facebook, Twitter, uh, Dig, and MySpace, and YouTube are, but the, the real important thing here is that this, these are channels that allow marketers to talk with consumers rather than at the public. And some people don't maybe know what Ning is. Anybody, people are familiar with Ning? Yeah, it's, if you're not, it's a platform that allows people to form groups and it actually kind of um, uh, uh, facilitates those groups that meet online being offline as well, which is a nice, uh, a nice model. Um, dynamics of social media is what that says. Uh, this is kind of my metaphor, and I apologize for the image, which doesn't project as well as I thought it was going to, but it's people uh, around a campfire. Um, and, and this is my metaphor for understanding what social media uh, is about. And I think it's, it's really it's a never-ending field of campfire. And when we talk to our clients, a lot of them still are very uneasy and hesitant and wary of, um, of going into Facebook. You know, it's the kind of thing that they, they think that they need to be at and in, but they're not sure what they should say when they get there. Uh, because it's a, it's a, it's a place, it's a context that they're unfamiliar with. But here are, here are companies that are actively playing, and I use the mix of both big national clients, some of which we deal with, and some local smaller people, because I know that's uh, smaller market, because I know that's the mix here. But obviously Ford is doing an amazing job in social media channels, and I think is setting the standard not only for the auto industry, but for a lot of other industries. Well, Toyota is in the midst of their enormous recall, and they're using this uh, this event to dramatically, to sort of quickly ramp up their uh, their social media presence, their Facebook presence, the number of fans they have following them. They've kind of um, you know put booster rockets on their social media efforts. I'm not so sure doing doing that in a period of such um, calamity it is such a great way to go. That's why I think people should be building uh, social media channels and relationships in good times <laughs> so that when when a bad time or a, or a calamity or a difficult time comes, you're already set up. You're not, you're not sort of doing it in that context. <laughs> Obviously, Zingerman's right here in Ann Arbor, I mean, they have thousands and thousands of followers. Uh, on Facebook, they have a Twitter feed. Um, and I put in Heron Hill Winery, uh, which is not a Michigan winery, it's New York State, but as a point of trivia, it's actually owned by one of Bill Ford's cousins. <laughs> it's on Hammondsport, it's in Hammondsport, New York, and they, um, they have a full-time, it's a small winery, but they have a full-time person devoted to social media. Um, and they've been doing it very well. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, social media campfire rules. As individuals, we can go to any campfire we want. I mean, that's just the way this works. Um, it's not. It's not us waiting for advertising to wash over us. We are creating our own pages, and we're going to other people's pages and websites um, that interest us. The instinct of big companies, when they go into social media, 
is they, they want to own the campfire. They, they, they don't want to join the campfire, they want to own it. Because that's what they're used to doing. They're used to buying time on national television, buying uh, print media. And, and when you ask them to sit down at the campfire, they're kind of out of their element because um, it's not a controlled situation. Uh, they're used to, they like control because they've got these hundreds of millions of dollars of budgets. They figure for that much money, we ought to be able to control the conversation, but they can't. Um, and that's really the advertising push model that they're trying to graduate from. Um, this is the mindset I talk to my clients about, which is um, you want to be a welcome member at the circle. Don't think about owning the circle. Um, and if you've ever spent time at a campfire, whether it was a camp or scouting or, or what have you, you kind of earn your place at the circle by the quality of stories you tell. Uh, and that's how you get people's attention, with the quality of stories you can tell. Um, again, I apologize for the art. Um, I thought I had it optimized right. Um, that is a picture of a, of a woman. She's a Ford customer. And she has um, an old an, an old truck behind her, a 33-year-old truck. That's her quote from her blog post that she put up on FordStory.com. Um, and I really like what Ford's doing here. They're, they're, they are a content machine as far as populating FordStory.com with content from their executives, um, and they mix posts on it between between white collar executives, blue collar workers, engineers, uh, and then of course <coughs> posts that are invited from customers, dealers, um, uh, people who are sort of part of the Ford extended family, and they're and and this content keeps coming up, and I think it's really broad, in my opinion, it's really broad that sense of um, Ford being a really human company. You know, part of their advantage in the marketplace has always been that, you know, the Fords are around. This is the, this Ford country. And people who live in Michigan know that if you've lived here, you you don't refer to Ford, you refer to Fords. Disaster. <laughs> and, and I think that this Ford story, the way that they've, I encourage you to go there, the website and really look at a lot of the content and see for yourself the mix and the tone of what they're doing there. Um, they kicked that off in 2008 amidst turmoil of the congressional hearings. Um, and even though it was a difficult time to start it, um, you know, Ford, if you recall, it was really GM and Chrysler that were plowed into that. And Ford was always kind of hovering above. So they were not doing it under tremendous duress. And not to the degree GM and Chrysler were. And not to the degree Toyota is now. And it was very smart in their communications department um, to really get that going and to start to tell their story in contrast um, to GM and Chrysler. And the outcome, you know, GM and Chrysler filed Chapter 11, Toyota admits is, is going through its problem. Ford now has the most fully developed social media platform in the industry. So they are beautifully positioned, in a sense, to take advantage of their rivals' misfortunes. And should Ford come to have a problem of their own, like Toyota, um, they are going to be really well positioned, having adapted not only the platform, but the mentality at Ford, that they have to be more transparent. They have to go, oh, I'm sorry. Fiesta movement is a 
uh, product-focused program that's kind of off to the side of, um, of Ford Story. And what they did, if people are not familiar with the Fiesta, it's a European, it's really a global vehicle they're introducing in the States later this year. And they started the social media marketing of this like 16, 17 months ago now. Um, no traditional advertising yet, none. They achieved 39% awareness of this product among Gen Y in the first 16 months. It's astonishing. All social media driven. For comparison, so you have that in perspective, the Ford Fusion awareness, which they've spent hundreds of millions of advertising on the last three years, four years, is less in this target group, Gen Y, than the Fiesta with no traditional advertising. To me, that is the most compelling metric I've come across if you're wondering, eh, should I really do it or not? Um, it, it, that's the, the contrast between those two are amazing. Um, now, Ford really takes, um, it's kind of what I call a hybrid approach, where they're, they control a lot of their social media messages, but they're also putting social media assets out into the market, out into other people's blogs and, and websites. And they're, they're creating these things so that people can download them, share them, et cetera. But they do take a very strong kind of central, centralized strategy in your one. Another model here is what I call sort of the open, the open model, and it's with Best Buy. Um, and if you're familiar with this, 12 Force is their Twitter feed. And this is employees, hundreds of employees, that are empowered to help public through Twitter. Now, it's, it's not just a bunch of people who are kind of on the fly replying and responding to consumers without a playbook. They're trained and they have very strict protocols and policies. And, and uh, there's something, if you're not familiar with the term social media governance, whether you have an organization of 15 or 15,000, if you're going to play in this space, you need to have a playbook of governance that everybody adheres to. There are rules of social media that you, uh, you want to adhere to so you don't, um, you don't make costly mistakes. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the results of them embracing social media, so, some of the results. They're the top CEO, uh, consumer electronics retail, and others in Walmart, I think. But as far as its specialty, they essentially drove Circuit City out of business. They're making Radio Shack nearly irrelevant, especially in the social media space. And they branded their service. Not just the store, but they branded their service between that and Geek Squad in an industry known for really crappy service and treatment of customers. Uh, on a smaller level, Heron Hill Winery, Amazon, their Facebook page has 400 fans, which for a winery that small is, is good. And they have been, at, I mean, it's building every week. Um, they have a blog that's done by employees from the top people, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the guy in charge of, of, of uh, making the wine, but also um, the people in the tasting room, the guy who is out trimming grapevines, he gets to have his story. And once they have this platform, it's a terrific platform for cross-promoting with the retailers that carry their wine and the restaurants that carry their wine. And I mean, this is one of the one of the blogs that they have is 30 years of pruning grapevines. This sweet older guy who's been doing it for 30 years. And you, through Facebook, you, you get to know this guy and you get to know his history. And you start to build affinity um, for this winery and for this brand that you know to know the people who are behind this through this medium. It's very powerful. Um, here's another one of my favorites, Artbeg Whiskey. Part of a big company, Moet Hennessy, um, sorry, it's Scotch, not Irish, I know we're in It has global distribution. Uh, it has 46,000 plus Facebook fans, but they also have this thing called the Community which they started 10 years ago. And this has grown to be a force of 50,000 people. And they have used 
social media and this committee of fans um, to really create an art bed cult. They are, I just read, um, they have a new product out. I want to point two pieces of business that, as business owners, you might be interested in. They're the most talked about. Even though they're one of the smaller distilleries, they are the most talked about. That was the phrase, uh, distillery in Scotland. And um, so they've got this ready fan base that they have this relationship with through social media for very hot, high margin, limited edition products that cost like over 100 bucks a piece, uh, 100 bucks a bottle. They, it's really direct marketing, but it's disguised as membership or this community. It's opt-in marketing and it's best. These people want to be in this, in this group, in this committee. They opted into it. Um, and this last point, uh, key to getting fans to look beyond age, Artbeg is, is a distillery that's only about, um, it reopened 10 years ago. If you know anything about scotch, you know that in order to charge big dollars, you have to have older stock, right? 12 year old, 16 year old, 18 year old. Well, they don't have that yet because they've only been open 10 years. They have used social media and this, and this committee to build this whole business model around non-aged whiskey so that they were able to charge like 80 bucks a bottle for whiskey that was only like five years old, uh, aged in the barrel. So here you're talking about using social media to change the whole business model of the, of the industry that was built on, in order to charge more, you had to age it more. And they've, they've used this beautifully. Um, if, you're, if you're whiskey fans, uh, I would encourage you to go to artbeg.com and, and explore what they have. You know, the local, obviously local company Zingerman's, Facebook alone, over 17,000 fans, you know, for a, a business that while it has direct marketing, obviously, to people around the world uh, who have kind of come through Ann Arbor, I mean, we all know their business footprint, physical footprint, does not extend outside Ann Arbor. Everything's based here. That's a big, big fan base uh, for an Ann Arbor-based company. Um, and it's, it's really a good site. I mean, if you're from here, you know about them. They, it, it, it provides a, um, a platform for a lot of interaction between customers and followers. And you know Zingerman, a lot of Zingerman's customers, a bunch of customers there. They're advocates for the place. I mean, they talk people into, into shopping there and, and buying stuff and eating here at the Roadhouse. I want to hit on a couple of problems that you can face in social media. Biggest one, if you're uh, if you're working at a big company, turf wars between the communications department and the marketing department because both departments want to own social media. They compete. They work at cross purposes. They work with different budgets. Um, I would point to Ford as another example where they're doing it right, where they are funding social media in one budget. It's made up of both communications and marketing people. Cut out of the turf war. I work with clients now, we deal with it every week, these turf wars between the communications and PR people and the marketing people. Uh, and it's very destructive and, and it, um, I don't know, it, but it's, if you can tackle it in your own organization to knock it down, I encourage you to try because it's, it's otherwise it's, uh, it holds you back. Obviously the push marketing mentality, people, um, companies, executives don't want to go into deep because they're not used to handing over content creation of their brand to the public. They want to control it all. Uh, unrealistic expectations. I deal with clients all the time that say, okay, I got these 1,500 fans on Facebook. Um, gosh, shouldn't they have 25,000 or 30,000 or what's 1,500 fans? You know, if you've only been at it for a couple of months and you have 1,500 fans, it's not because it's a failure of Facebook as a medium, it's because you're not using it right. Uh, you're not putting the right assets up. There's probably aren't the right attitude. Also, a lot of clients um, want to know, how is this going to help my sales? I think that social media, for the most part, is a top of the sales funnel um, tool. Not, a, not one that's going to convert 
uh, to sales. There are other people, you know, who have a different view. They're working on all kinds of different um, applications to try to make, to try to turn social media fans into transactions. You know, good luck with that. Uh, it's not my game. Some dealers, for example, car dealers are trying to do that. Um, some are having success. It's tough, though. I think it's more of a brand building, being myself. Um, and don't be the brand that hands it. Remember the campfire metaphor? Don't be the brand that starts handing out business cards at the campfire. Nobody likes that guy. Um, damage control. I want to hit on a couple of quick examples where people ran into problems. Um, um, HP Hewlett Packard. They responded to complaints that spread around the blogs and the internet that a webcam face tracking software product was racist. Now, if you're in the PR marketing department and you got blogs accusing the company of being racist, that's a meeting. <laughs> you got to have a meeting. There are certain things that that create instant meetings and a whole lot of phone calls. Racist, gay bashing, Nazis is always good. You mentioned Nazis. That's that's a that's a that'll get the phones ringing in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you're consider if you it's anti, you know, if you're accused of being anti women you know, against women or anti feminists. Um, in this case, it was you know, they reacted very quickly. They quickly explained that there was a weakness in the in the uh, software uh, simply to to pick up dark that it wasn't racist. But they were glad that people brought it to their attention and they, and they upgraded it and fixed it you know, very quickly. Uh, another, another case was interesting, a uh, very different kind of case. Honda built a Facebook page, and they were not very big on Facebook at this point, for a new product called the Cross Tour. Um, and the public responded very badly to the photos that were posted. It hardly looked ugly. And that, that, was the, that was the gist of the comments. This, God, this car looks awful. I mean, that was the thing. Well, Honda was like, yikes, what did you do here? Because now we've got a branded Facebook page and we've let public onto it and they're running down our product. What are we paying for this for? But what did they do? They went in and started deleting negative posts. And once they did that, the blogs like Jalopnik and, and Autoblog picked up on that, started amplifying what cowards Honda was, uh, weren't willing to hear people's criticisms. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, some, remember what I said about Best Buy and, and this whole social media governance? You have to have a strategy that everybody knows and understands. They had some rogue employees that thought they would help out by posting positive comments about the product, only they didn't identify themselves as Honda employees. It took minutes for the blogs that were onto this to identify those people as Honda employees. And then they got accused of, it, it was a mess. I mean, it was an absolute mess. And it comes from not being organized, from just diving in the pool before you know what's in the water. You know, it's... Uh, so here's here's some so here's some questions that if you're depending on where you are in the social media continuum, um, if you're not in with both feet, if you're not in at all, here are some questions I think you should ask yourself. As I do this, what, what am I doing? Am I fostering a community? Okay. Ask yourself if if you're if you're in it just to sell your product or your brand, um, and you're using it as an advertising medium. Uh, not so much. You want to start with this idea, how can I foster a community? What are the shared values between my brand or company and my customers and the fans that I can center this channel on beyond my product and brand? So here's a, let's take Zingerman's, okay? A lot of what they do in social media is about supporting local agriculture and sourcing. It's not about Zingerman, Zingerman, Zingerman's, okay? Um, I would love to see some companies uh, use social media to really champion, not by them, but by Michigan first. That's a different shared value to help our economy. The Nissan Leaf is a new electric uh, car. 
They are really pushing zero emission of driving, not by the leaf, by the leaf. Um, I'm working with a client now that um, I can't get into, it, but I'll, wants to really be a brand associated with opera and delivering opera uh, experiences to people in new, exciting ways. Um, and again, if you're in, um, let's say you're, you're a car company, instead of selling the, the car, you might want to try to create your community around total fuel savings information. Assets, not only driving, but home, you know, saving you know, all kinds of information and advocacy about making your homes more fuel efficient. Um, and then, you know, am I bringing people together at my fire for something other than buying my stuff? Because if you're not, then I don't think you really understand the community. Um, sorry. I am not Mr. PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm a writer. <laughs> okay. Uh, here we go. Um, and this is just the last thought. The campfires, I apologize for the yard again. The, the campfires, social media campfires are burning. They're out there. With you or without you. I suggest, if you're one of those companies that says, eh, I don't feel comfortable, I don't want to do it, I think you're better off at the fire than away from the fire, letting other people have the conversation about you. Um, and that's my, that's kind of my wrap up, and I want to give us time for some Q&A. Thank you. That was great, David, thanks so much. Um, well, let's start with Q&A. I was wondering if, um, we decide to go the social media route, should we also set aside a lot of time to do this every day and responding to people? Here, here's an interesting, uh, I'm going to, uh, I can probably bellow my way through the room without having to. But Heron Hill Winery, my example, right? Small winery. Um, they really don't distribute much outside of New York State. Um, they have a, I can't tell you what they pay her, but they have designated a full-time person to getting this built and managing it. So I don't know how many hours a week, if she's a 40-hour week person or a 20-hour week. Um, I would suggest that it depends on the company. You know, if I was to start a company, uh, right now what I would do is, since I have a strong orientation for it, I would oversee it, but I would probably ask someone I could afford to get it up and running, and then I see where I see where I was in terms of you know how much. But it's it's not something. I think some people who are really good at it, really adept, and have a facility for it, you can probably handle it at, up to a point yourself, and then you've got to hire somebody to manage it. Additional questions. Can you address the advantages slash disadvantages of the different venues, Facebook, Twitter, big, um, et cetera? I think, uh, before you read the question, I think you know, Facebook is the Google of um, social media channels. It just, it just is. Um, it's the easiest. They make it very easy to work with. Um, it still has a good diversity of um, of, uh, of users. There are some, the one thing, I think if you're just getting started, I would definitely start with Facebook and do a Twitter feed as well. To me, that's the, the, the logical entry point. After that, once you get your feet in the pool, you know, you get all the way in the pool and you start to feel comfortable, then you can start to look at um, some of the emerging social media channels. Like Ning, we mentioned that forms group. It helps you form groups online and, and offline. Um, and certainly, you know, having a YouTube channel that you can that you can link with your Facebook page and, and Twitter feed. Um, I think those are the, still the big building blocks. There's talk and chatter and some data that show that the younger people who started Facebook, the Gen Y people, are migrating out in some numbers to smaller emerging 
social networks. It's like, you know, once they got friended by their by their mom and grandma, they're like, this is no longer the cool place to be. So. How do you know when you're there or what it is that you're doing? What <clears throat> What the impact is both positive and negative. And you talked about the fact that some of the impacts can be negative. <coughs> and is anybody measuring that? And how do you measure um, what, what the impact is? What is it that you're getting for your effort in terms of brand awareness or anything else? If you're a big company like a Ford, Hyundai, and Toyota, and you have big budgets, you can. You know, you're engaging firms like Buzz Metrics and things like that. that that's, a, that's an actual firm. And they have ways of, of giving you reports that are expensive, um, you know, to, you know, that shows your positive and negative, you know, energy, if you will, through your social media channels. If you're a smaller <coughs> company without those kinds of budgets, um, there are emerging, there are companies that are developing tools for this all the time that are, that are priced differently. Once you're in, um, you know, maybe it's a topic for, for another uh, uh, lunch, but um, as I say, they're, they're emerging all the time and help you. But clearly, if you have a Facebook page or a Twitter feed and you have somebody monitoring that, you know which way the wind is blowing now on the pages themselves. The other thing you obviously do is you can put together you know, a pretty simple reference um, system where you know, you're asking your customers how they care about you. You know, and give them, you know, you, you know, whether it's friend, you can specify Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And then you, you see what that, um, uh, what that feedback is. What I would caution everybody about is if you're going into this space new, give it Okay. It does not cost very much to build up Facebook and Twitter feeds and to give it time. It's a little like gardening. You know, you can't you can't sow the seeds and then go back every day and look. You know, I mean, you got to give it time to grow. There was another question back here. Can you enlighten me a little bit more on the whole around the campfire passing your business card out thing? What I, what I meant is the, 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 the metaphor is, you know, imagine that you're in like a scouting or you're just, you know, you're camping, right? And, and there's a bonfire, okay? To me, that is basically the metaphor for social media. And, you're, and you're, you're on your own, but there's a bonfire with eight people around it already. And you're like, okay, uh, you know, rather than build my own fire, I'll ask if I can join this one. And you don't want to be the person who sits down at the campfire and says, you know, by the way, I'm from uh, Amalgamated Insurance. Would you like my car? Who wants that person at the fire? So what I'm saying is that that's why I talked about those shared values. Um, in, you know, while Zingerman's is one of the reasons Zingerman's is really successful is that they're constantly talking about um, artisanal ingredients and uh, heirloom varieties and sourcing local. Okay, those those are attributes of the Zingerman's business, right? But they are what I would call shared values. They are attracting people for whom those things are important, and for people who are who are okay with paying more in order to support those things. That's a shared value. To me, that's that's not selling Zingerman's. That is promoting shared value between you and your customer base. And, you know, it's again the handing your business card out. It's like if you if your social media channels are all about just selling and trying to create a transaction, you know, you start feeling like the lawyer who shows up at the funeral to hand out business cards. It's just you're not so welcome. People don't gravitate to your brand that way. That's 
That's terrific. Um, fortunately, we've run out of time for additional questions. So another round of applause for Peter Kiley. Thank you so much. Before, before I pass the mic over to Dare for additional messages, I'm going to pass over to Megan for a special announcement about sponsorship. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Crosby. Um, if you are interested in sponsoring our e-newsletters that go out every Monday, please see me. I can give you more information. You can get just one week or you can do an entire month. Okay, so see me afterwards. Thanks. At, at, the, risk of, uh, at the risk of humiliating myself after what I just said, if you're interested in my business card, <laughs> I have some up here. So... <laughs> great. Thank, thanks to you for uh, running the show today. Thanks, David. Great talk. Um, quick announcement. We're about to do introductions, which means we're going to pass the mic. You can stand up and give us your name and your company, just so we all can help get to know each other. Pay the men and women in black, right? All right they're your servers. Um, you can tip extra, about the 10 bucks if you want. It's up to you. And the thing I wanted to say, what do they want to say? Oh, the uh, couple things. Ignite is tomorrow. How many people are going to Ignite Ann Arbor? A few of you? Okay. It's probably sold out. Is it sold out? Yes. Okay, it's sold out. So if you're not going, don't worry about it. But I, I, I do encourage you to go to the uh, A2 Fiber website. Um, LA2M really should support this. Ann Arbor is working to get Google High Speed Internet brought to Ann Arbor, right? Uh, very high speed, one gigabit, one gigabit per second downloads. So go to a2fiber.com. Please become a fan of them on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash a2fiber. And because community participation is a big part of winning this bid. I think it could be really good for our business community, our academic community, etc. So, okay. You can please go around the room. We're going to have to be brief today because it is, it's 11.42. And as you know, we finish at 1, right? Right, right? So, yeah. So we're going to we're going to... It's 1242, right? We don't have an hour and 18 minutes. We have 18 minutes. So let's see if we can go around the entire room, give us your name and your company, and then pass to a friend, and we'll get all the way around. And you can start, sir. Stand up. Hello, David Blake, Art Pride. 